Greetings, and welcome to the How We Do Digital Ministry Podcast. I'm Christopher Harris, founder of Faith Growth. Um, You can find us online at faithgrowth.com, where we help our church clients build their digital presence and engage their communities online. On this podcast, I have a conversation with a church leader and ask them to share how they do digital ministry in their communities. Uh, Today, I am talking with the Reverend Daniel Brereton. He is the priest in charge at St. John's Dixie Anglican Church in Mississauga, Ontario. That's right. We have gone international. Um, Reverend Daniel, please introduce yourself and tell us how you do digital ministry. Well, hello. Uh, As you've said, my name is Daniel. A lot of people know me as Rev Daniel on Twitter. That's my Twitter handle. Uh, And that's primarily how I do digital ministry. Um, I mean, I'm on, I'm on several social media platforms, but I think uh, the, the platform that I mainly use um, and I, I probably engage in ministry the most on is through Twitter. Um, I am an Anglican priest. Uh, I've been ordained 23 years. Um, I've been, or I've been at my current parish about eight years in several different uh, job, <laughs> in several different positions. Uh, I'm now the incumbent. Um, and uh, I mean, COVID, like for a lot of uh, people, has has really forced my church to be more online uh, and to engage with that uh, more intentionally than it, and it has in the past. Um, I am I am openly gay uh, and married, uh, and that's I, that's a big part of my identity, not only for myself but for others, mm-hmm. uh, and has been a big part of my I think online ministry as well. Um, so in terms of how I do digital ministry, um, it it really is something that has grown organically. I didn't set out to be to do digital ministry. Um, I never, I, I never, other than having a church website and, and thinking I need to update that occasionally, that's probably as far <laughs> as I ever went with the idea of digital ministry. Um, but I started on Twitter about probably about eight years ago, just after I got to St. John's. Um, and it was my husband that introduced me to Twitter because he was on it and he used it primarily for work, but I didn't get it. I just, I was like, <laughs> it's, it's like, first of all, I, how can you say anything in that small brief of a, of a time? I'm not known for brevity. I've since learned that you can do threads and that's very helpful. Um, I also live downtown Toronto. So if you hear sirens going by, I apologize for that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I got on Twitter and it just kind of grew. And I, I was on primarily just out of curiosity. I, I wanted to engage with people, um, meet people in different places. Uh, and it was just a personal thing. But the more that I shared myself uh, and who I am and what I do, um, the more I found people wanted to talk to me about two things. Uh, well, and two things that were interrelated. Uh, the fact that I, I'm a priest, uh, that I'm an ordained minister, uh, and I work for a church, and I'm openly gay. And how do those things go together? And uh, and I found myself having more and more conversations, people sending me tweets, people sending me direct messages, asking for resources, asking to have conversations around faith, sometimes around sexuality, sometimes around their children's sexuality. Uh, you know, what do I do as a Christian father, but my son has just come out uh, or my da- my my daughter is trans or my child is now saying they're non-binary. What do I do with that? Mm-hmm. Um, and so slowly I just I found myself becoming an advocate and a resource. And um, and and those those engagements were were life giving to me because because I realized, oh, th- like this is ministry and this is what. That's, this is what we do, uh, but this is just happening in a different format and in a place I never expected. Um, and then of course COVID happened and suddenly I had to put together a YouTube channel for the first time for my church and we were recording services and putting those online. Uh, and the great thing is I had built up a, a Twitter following by that point uh, that I could sort of channel what we were doing at St. John's through that. So, so we were suddenly getting a lot of engagement Uh, at our church and people coming to our Zoom Bible studies and and meetings uh, to the point where more people from online, uh, what what we call our online community, are engaging with us in those things than than people in the local community. (laughs) They just just are waiting for church to sort of open up again and get back to normal. Um, But suddenly we have this whole online community of people who very much feel our church is their church, that I am their pastor. that this is where they come for 
worship and for uh, you know spiritual nourishment and and it all happens online mm -hmm. and and so for what for me one of the things that's that's happened is I've realized that relationships and community online is real. It's not pseudo community. It's not um, alternative community. I mean, it, it's, it's real community. It's different. Um, uh, and it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily take the place of in-person community, but it's just as legitimate and just as valid. Yes. Um, and, and for a lot of people, it is the only way that they can connect for, for, different reasons, uh, reasons of ability, reasons of, um, you know, they, they, they don't feel safe in a, in a church, uh, in a physical church, um, or there just isn't one around them that they feel welcome or they can engage with. And suddenly, you know, the internet has allowed them to travel and, and go elsewhere. Um, so finding those people and, and making those connections has been really eye-opening for me uh, because it's, it's just as real for them as the person sitting in a pew. Well, I, you know, there's like three, three things that I'll, I'll I want to unpack from what you said there that I just think are awesome. I mean, number one, I, I did say I couldn't be brief. So I know, I well, you're, well, I, you know, number one actually goes to the brief though. What I think where I have learned from you in so many ways actually is how you in a hundred or well, 240 characters these days, uh, really can give some insight into a particular scripture uh, reading, you know, the lessons for Sunday. Mm -hmm. I, I, so, which I find interesting. It's like you find a way to be very brief there and have unlocked some uh, passages for me uh, in some new ways and some new interpretations that have been very powerful for me personally. So, you do have the brevity when when you're forced, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I think my parishioners wonder why that doesn't translate into my sermon. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and then the other thing that excites me kind of about your ministry is that, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, I'm down in the States and, um, you know, the kind of religious culture that we export, I guess we should say, is very monolithic and very focused a lot of times on who is not included, uh, unfortunately. And, you know, I have come from a rich tradition uh, in the Lutheran Church, ELCA specifically, that's been more open and accepting. Uh, and, you know, but we're not known for that, you know. And so, I, you know, I mean, A, you know, it's your personal story as well as your uh, faith experience. And so one of the things that I've thought is so powerful for digital ministry and churches in general is like, you know, we need, we're kind of like a good secret in a way of like this life-giving affirmation of God accepting us for who we are, who God created us to be, and where we are. And, um, you know, instead of, hey, you need to do this to get God's love. And, you know, how do we as a church really put that out there? And I think you're doing a very good job of, of putting that out there um, in a way that is accessible and, and, and really helping people find the love and acceptance that we know is available in, God, in God's grace. Um, and so that excites me. And I think, you know, as, as a, as a whole churches that are more inclusive like that, you know, I want us to really get that message out there. Um, and I think digital ministry is a powerful way uh, to do that. So yeah, good on you there. Uh, <laughs> so one of the questions I always love to ask all of our guests is where have you, you know, what, if there's an experience you wouldn't mind sharing of a time you've seen God at work online or encountered God online, um, Share with us about that a little. Oh, I mean, the, lots of times. Um, uh, I think, I think the, the 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 times that I've I've really felt and experienced the presence of God in digital ministry. Um, a lot of those times, what what the thread that weaves them all together is is when someone who is um, someone who's searching, someone who's uh, who who wants to you know who feels distanced from God or distanced from the church and is not being able to distinguish them you know to distinguish the two um, uh, that that institutional religion or you know spiritual abuse uh, scriptural abuse has gotten in the way of them experiencing God mm -hmm. um, and somehow we are able you know that person and I are able to have a conversation it might be them responding to something I tweet. Um, it might be me asking them a question or responding to something they've put out. And then suddenly there's this connection. And through our discussion, you, you feel 
like the walls start to come down. It, you know, it's sort of like, um, I'm, I'm, I hate religion and I'm angry at God. And these are all the very legitimate reasons I feel that way. But then through our conversation, you feel the walls start to drop and suddenly they're like, they're open to, to God in a way that they hadn't experienced before, or, or they're thinking about something in a way that they had never looked at or never thought they were allowed to think of that, that way before. Um, and it's that, I mean, so way back at the beginning of my ministry, I remember, um, I remember saying uh, to my bishop, you know, when I was being interviewed as to like why I want to be ordained and stuff, I, I said, I remember saying I want to be a bridge, you know, I want to, or I want to build bridges between people um, and the church and, and communities that feel ostracized. Um, and I had no idea how I was going to do that, but it sounded very profound and deep at the time. And I, <laughs> I, I do that. And, and then one day, a few years later, I was into ministry. I was sitting on a lot of panels, discussions around same-sex marriage and what the church was going to do about that. And I was getting really tired of the conversations and some of the really abusive comments that I would get and feeling really beat up about that. And I remember going back to that same bishop and saying, I don't want to be part of these conversations anymore. And I remember he said to me, don't you remember saying you want to build bridges? And I said, yes, but I don't think I'm doing that. And, and he had a very wise thing to say. He said, sometimes you are the bridge. <laughs> and, wow. and that he goes, and bridges get walked on, but it's how people get from one side to the other. And I never forgot that. Um, wow. I don't think it means that we're always meant to be doormats that get walked all over. But yes, yeah, sometimes uh, in making those connections, we ourselves are the bridge for somebody. Um, and that's not always a comfortable place to be in, but if it helps someone move from one place to another, that's where I, I see the work of God. Um, and if he can use me, great. And, uh, you know, sometimes I'm maybe an obstacle to somebody instead of a bridge. But um, th those are the times when I see someone going from one place to, an, to a new place, a more life-giving place. And, I, and that's when I, I know God's at work. Awesome. Now, I like... <laughs> wise bishops sometimes the bishops are so sometimes, annoying yeah. so, well, they're so annoying when they're profound like that um I that's mean, why i hold on to that it's that rare moment when i agreed with the bishops so. exactly. <laughs> exactly i know yeah gosh that's a job i wouldn't want to be honest with you but uh well actually when i was a kid i really loved all i won't lie i loved all the pomp and circumstance well the well, just, you know, they get, well, exactly. They get the better clothes. They get the they get all the fun stuff. Um, and I did think when I was younger, oh, I would love to do that. And then I kind of learned what that position really had to do day in and day out. And yeah. oh, God love them. Uh, <laughs> I think and that is one of the things I don't like about digital ministry is it doesn't highlight my clothes at all. <laughs> and I got into it partly for the costume. But exactly. anyway, <laughs> I love. Well, you know, I think, though, that you do kind of a good job of that with because I like the way, you know, transition a little bit to what some of your congregations doing. I like the little worship highlight or preview reel, we'll call it. That you put, <laughs> My trailers. You, yeah, your tra well, no, I, I think that's it's one of the things I've I've seen that y'all put together and I think is a good idea because that's just kind of how the Internet works on things like this. Um, and they get me to click play quite a few times. There you go. Um, and I and I and I see, you know, from procession to like I just know this last Sunday, um, I like that you had the young man read uh, yes. from, from the 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 gospel about the kids, basically. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and I believe he's in Britain, right? Or is he in Canada? Or no, he and his mother, who did the first reading, um, are in the UK in Oxford, and they, um, they yeah, they're they're some of our online community, and they're very faithful, and they're at zoom coffee hour every week and uh i've never physically met them yet although I, I look forward to it but yeah they've been that's another example of of you know um a family that wasn't finding a, a church that they felt comfortable in and and welcome in and um and he and i uh the the boy and i've had some conversations online just he and i like kind of you know almost like confirmation classes and so it just makes you realize like digital ministry it it's real it can happen yes well and the other thing you know tell us a little bit about because what i think a lot of people might look at you and go oh you know you've been like well what i've heard today number one you know you've been doing twitter what was it eight plus years yeah um and so yeah you kind of built a following there um 
but I mean, I don't, and this is just me kind of looking from the outside so you can correct any assumptions uh, that I have wrong here. You know, y'all as a parish have kind of taken this step by step. You didn't necessarily just dump a ton of money and know what you were doing from day one just because you've been on Twitter for eight years. You've really, even learning, like you said, your husband got you on Twitter. He had to teach you what was going on there. You weren't, you know, how do I communicate in this? You know, so it seems to me that you've just kind of, as appropriate, embrace new technology, kind of learned it, got a little bit better at it, a little bit better at it, and really kind of grew it organic. And it wasn't so much about the the technology or, um, you know, at the, at the core, it's still the same message. I don't, um, and that is what's really resonating is the message. Uh, but would that be a fair uh, description of kind of how, um, how, you know, how you've built, uh, you know, well, built i don't like that word but how you're doing digital ministry how you've kind of progressed in your digital ministry path i don't know that's a no yeah no i mean it is it is totally the way i i i'm not like i'm not a technical guy i don't and and by nature i'm always um nervous of and afraid of anything new i just assume i don't know how that works i'm never going to use it i say that every time and then i end up becoming like you know oh a master of it you know but (laughs) um uh but but I, I don't, because the technology and the, and the, 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 the digital platforms themselves don't interest me. It's, it's what you can do with it. And so it's only when I see a use for it, that it becomes useful. I don't, uh, you know, I don't find myself suddenly getting on something just because it's new. Um, it's, it's like, this is what I want to do. And, and could this help me do that? So it's, again, it's, it's the technology is the instrument. It's at the service of the ministry, not, it, it, you know, I'm not trying to make my ministry fit the technology. Um, so there's lots of things, you know, we could be doing more of and, and probably doing better. Um, like a lot of churches, I, you know, my church is actually a pretty small church. It's a very small, I have a staff of like one and, and a half time director of music. Um, so a lot of it also falls on me. Um, and so my church's digital ministry has really depended on what my resources and abilities are. Uh, So that's something we're looking at because it's expanding and it's going beyond what one person can manage. Um, uh, But it's also a way of engaging lay people and younger people uh, in ministry because this is something they'd like to do and they know how to do. Um, So that's an opportunity as well. But yeah, it it has grown. I've kind of let the spirit lead. Like I don't really, I, and maybe this is a failing on my part, but I don't really have a digital plan <laughs> it's <laughs> i just kind of go with the flow and see what opportunities present themselves uh, and it's worked so far oh well, that's good yeah it's worked well uh <laughs> so, um so kind of along that line uh any what would be your kind of best advice for other ministers out there trying you know you know trying you know they know digital is important and they're trying to figure it out or trying to do you know something I mean, I think obviously there are, uh, and this is a whole another conversation, I'm sure, but I mean, there are issues around boundaries. There's issues around privacy issues. Uh, you know, um, I've learned that you're, you're always representing the church, whether you claim to be or not, whether you put, you know, all things I post are my own ideas and blah, blah, blah in your bio. It doesn't matter what you say is going to be representative of the institution, for people. So you have to, you have to keep that in mind. Um, and you have to have boundaries and you have to be uh, careful about those things. But all that said, um, I think the most important thing is authentic authenticity and to be yourself and to bring yourself. Because even if you're, even if it's like your church's Twitter account or your church's Facebook page, um, people don't want to engage with an organization. They want to engage with people. So even if you're representing a community and an an institution, people have to have a sense of personality there. There has to be a person and a personality that they're connecting with. Um, And that's what people find engaging. Um, So the more you can bring your, your, yourself, again, with boundaries, it doesn't mean you want to share everything uh, and people have different ideas about how much they want to share online, but, but I think you need to be you and Mm -hmm. uh, the person they engage with on Twitter has to be the same person that they're going to find in the pulpit on Sunday. Um, and because otherwise they don't trust you. They don't trust what you're saying. 
Uh, and the more you can be yourself, the more you give permission to other people to be themselves. And that's where two authentic people are having an authentic conversation and real stuff happens. So, so bring your authentic self to your online ministry. It's profound. Talk a little bit about boundaries in that, uh, you know, I've, I've watched, you know, like everybody has to decide what's best for them. And I know that it gets more complicated. You know, I've heard once you kind of hit 10,000 followers on Twitter, the experience is a lot different. Um, and I know that you're intentional about taking time away. You're intentional about, I'm not even looking at the DMs today or, um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. I think even so often you delete all your tweets or is that somebody, okay? Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> would you like to talk anything about that or just kind of tell, I mean, not so much about the specific boundaries, but how did you figure out what worked for you, I guess, would be the, the core question. I mean, you know, when you suddenly see when it's not working anymore, you know, you realize something has to change. And yeah, I think as, as your following grows, it, it does it change the experience because suddenly any little thing you tweet immediately goes viral just because you have so many people who are going to share it. Right. And so, and the more people that engage with it, the more comments you get, the more negativity you get as well. Um, so I find that, um, be, you know, practicing a digital Sabbath is really good. Uh, you know, the same principles that apply to Sabbath in other ways should apply to our online lives as well. Um, you just need that distance and that, that rest. Um, I mean, both the blessing and the curse of online ministry are this sort of two sides of the same coin. The blessing is you're, you're accessible. You have access to so many people and so many resources and so many conversations. And so your reach increases, but the flip side of that is it means that you are also accessible to so many people. Um, and so my, my, my pastoral responsibilities have grown exponentially because suddenly someone online has sent a, a message saying, oh, I'm having surgery tomorrow. They think it may be cancer. Would you pray for me? And then it's like, oh, I need to make sure I check in with that person. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so suddenly, as well as my physical congregation, I've got this online community who are also uh, needing pastoral care. And that, you know, that increases my, my sense of responsibility. So you need a break from that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so every once in a while, I do also delete all my tweets, which is not a way of hiding anything, because I know that once it's out there, it's out there. People have screenshots. People remember what you've tweeted. So it's not about... Um, it's not about hiding or regretting anything I've tweeted, although I'm sure I've regretted what I tweeted, but, but it's just, I need the psychological, like wipe the slate clean. Um, and if other people remember conversations and want to keep going fine, but it is also a good way of sort of just bringing things to a close and starting fresh. Um, and I psychologically and emotionally, I need that. Otherwise it's kind of like, I'm one of those people that has to clean out my, my inbox or else I just feel an incredible amount of pressure seeing them there. So that's what I need to do with tweets as well. And so that works for me. It, it wouldn't work for other people, but yeah. I, I think protecting your space and your energy and also recognizing when my online ministry and my online life is getting way more time than my family and my, my congregation here. Um, when that gets out of balance, then I know I need to address that. So, Yeah. No, I think that's good. I mean, I think it's what I like, you know, kind of about that is there's not one, I mean, other than the digital Sabbath, I don't think there's one best way to approach it. We, you kind of have to decide with your personality um, and, you know, and what time can I give this versus the other parts of my life and, um, and, and what responsibility I'm going to take on here and then how can I best structure it, uh, you know, structure those boundaries or, yeah this ministry to do that um tell me uh if there is uh any you know time that you know like what, what's your best lesson learned with uh with doing digital ministry uh uh that we you know maybe a failure or something that we can learn from or you're like oh we won't do it that way again uh yeah um i mean i think i think sometimes just forgetting uh, for me, this has been one of the one of the biggest mistakes I've made in the past is is forgetting how public it is. 
which maybe that doesn't make sense. Of course it's public, duh. But you you can sometimes get into a, a conversation with one individual and then it starts to feel like it's just you and that person in a room privately having a conversation and you forget a ton of people can see and listen in and aren't necessarily getting the whole conversation or understanding the context. So, I mean, I remember one person being deeply offended uh, because, you know, and she was someone that had started following me because I felt safe. Um, and then I made a comment to, to somebody privately, I thought privately, um, okay. that, I mean, she took it out of context, but, but I could see how what I said sounded very um, offensive to her. And suddenly that made me unsafe to her. Um, she and I ended up being able to have a conversation about it and kind of get past that. But it, it, was, it was a moment where I kind of like, oh, you've got to remember that everything you put up there is for a huge audience and they're all, and they're not all necessarily part of the entire conversation or the, the context. So how will this read? You know, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I'm sarcastic. I, I, you know, make quips. I, you know, love the sort of throwaway comments. Uh, I think they're funny, but there've been times when I've, you know, I've tweeted it and then immediately went, Oh, that could be read totally the wrong way. And I'll go back and, and delete it hopefully before anyone sees it. Sometimes <laughs> I don't get there in time. So that's, that's, that's one thing. Um, the other, I, the other thing was just, um, I remember once, uh, coming back from a walk and I posted all these pictures of, you know, here's, you know, my husband and I had this wonderful walk today and isn't it lovely. And I hadn't been paying attention to what was going on. And it was all like, it was just when the whole black lives matter thing was, was exploding. And um, it was just very tone deaf. Mm -hmm. uh, and no, I don't think you have to be advocating all the time and everything has to be about the most current event. But I, I suddenly realized like I posted all this stuff that looked very, white upper class privileged and was so tone deaf to what everybody else that of my followers were talking about and and some people were hurt by that so i think also just sort of reading the room is sometimes yeah. a good thing yeah yeah well and i think you know acknowledging you're not always going to get it right and then what is the strategy you're like hey i'm going to delete it and redo it or i'm going to yeah, uh, I'm going to have a, a hey, we're going to have a conversation with this person and try to figure that out. Um, you know, but I think that's that's I think that's the important part is acknowledging it, like not just not just try to sweep it under the table or hide it and go, OK, well, I won't do that again. But saying, yeah, I did this and I offended someone or I, I upset you. Uh, and that's that's what makes it better, not just getting rid of it, but actually acknowledging that it was a mistake sure. and you're not yeah. perfect. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good, 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 good. Tell me a little bit about um, where you see uh, the future of the church headed in general, um, the church universal Catholic, as it were. Oh, um, uh, well, if I tell you, I'll have to kill you. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> God has not unveiled the blueprint to me personally. <laughs> But I, I mean, I think I think online ministry and and digital ministry is 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 just part of it now. And, um, you know, I think we're all still navigating what that looks like. And, and you know, again, what are the boundaries and how does that fit with in person community and how do they how do they compete with each other? How do they support one another? How are they the same and how are they different? And we're trying to figure that all out. But but online community and connections is is going to be a big part of the church in the future. Um, and I think we have to get over the idea that you make connections online to get them into your pews or to get them into the building. Um, COVID has exploded the whole idea as, as you know, we've always known the church is not the building, but I think we hold on to physical gatherings and physical things and making that the center of the, the life of the church. Um, and while those things are important and they have their place, uh, because I certainly have missed being together in a sacred space, uh, you know, that's been hallowed by years of prayer. I mean, all those things are important. The sacraments are important. But, but learning how to, 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 to do that with people who may never set foot in a building, who may never be physically present to you, but still as value that relationship and that connection. I think that's going to be something the church really has to wrestle with. Um, and I see, I see a lot of 
push back one way or the other. I either almost like everything is online, it all can be on Zoom and the physical gatherings and our physical buildings should just be mowed down because they're not important at all. I see, I've seen that and I've also seen the opposite, which is like online isn't real and we need to get back to, we just need to get everybody back into our buildings. And neither of those approaches I think are the, are the future. I would agree. I, I just think it doesn't recognize how people work today I yeah, mean, yeah. You know, and how they uh, and just I mean, online is not a destination anymore. Like when we or at least when I got online in 1996 or some, you know, AOL and all that, it was more it was a destination at that time. Yeah. Now yeah. I carry it in my pocket 24 seven, basically. Um and so, yeah, how do we do that as a church? But, you know, the interesting thing about some of the people are like, oh, we can just go online and we don't need the buildings and things. I always am like, but every community or every strong relationship I've made online, <laughs> at some point, we want to get together. Yeah, yeah, um, you want to meet. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, yeah, you're right. I think there's a place for both, but what is it? It's going to look a little different. And especially when our whole evangelism strategy for at least the last 50 years has been more this just come to uh you know come to us and then yeah. that's when everything starts whether that was worship bible study you know it always but you had that big ask of come to the door or come yeah. through the door yeah. and then everything we have to offer started at that moment um yeah. and that'll be the, that to me is like the biggest transformation because it's going to start so much that is one option that they're still going to have to come through that door but now look at all these other options um yeah so we are just about out of time uh so i want to give you the last word is there any um you know it, well i always say is there anything that i that you would have wanted to talk about that i didn't ask about or any uh, advice you'd like to leave our listeners with or just you know give us a parting blessing anything there uh i'll give you the last word uh, I, is there anything I, that we haven't talked about? No, I mean, I think, I think we had a great conversation. Um, I, I would just, I would just encourage people to explore, uh, to, to do what works for you and, and works within your community, but to realize that there's, um, digital ministry provides opportunities that you, you, you never, you would never know is out there. I mean, there's, there are people out there looking for you and looking for exactly what you and your community offer and digital ministry just allows you to put it out there um, uh, for people to find you because they will. And um, you know, what, what, who I am and what my, my, my community offers is not for everybody, but what, what you specifically have to offer, there is someone out there that's looking exactly for that. So trust the spirit to make those connections. Yes. Well, thank you. So I want to say thank you, Reverend Daniel, for being our guest on how we do digital ministry. I want to invite all of our listeners uh, to make sure that you follow and subscribe to our podcast, either, you know, uh, add us in your favorite podcast app or subscribe on our YouTube channel. Um, Reverend Daniel, how can our listeners find and follow you online? Uh, best place would be Twitter. <laughs> and uh, that's at Rev Daniel. Uh, and uh, you, at, if you go there, you'll also find a link to my church's YouTube channel. And I would love to, uh, I would love to hear from you if you want to send me a message. Wonderful. We'll put links uh, to your Twitter and YouTube channel in the show notes for everybody. Uh, thanks again for listening. We would also like to connect with you, dear listener, in another way. Uh, we would, we have a private Facebook group called how we do digital ministry. The link is below in the show notes. We'd love for you to join us over there so we can discuss all things digital ministry for the next six days until we drop our a new episode of this show. Uh, until next week, peace and blessings to you all. <laughs>